Hello. Hi. So this, I don't know whether it's my computer or. Uh, it's starting to get a little slow. It's starting to get a little <clears throat> I'm trying to sh share my screen, but it's working really slow. Yeah, it looks like we might be suffering some brand issues. Um, it might be worth trying one more time. Oh, there it goes. Oh, okay. I still don't see anything on my screen. So I can see, it looks like your uh, a directory that has your PDFs in it for the talk, probably. I don't see anything. No mouse pointer, nothing on those screens. I don't know what's going on. Um, do you see my screen? I can see, yeah, it looks like one of your, you know, directly. It, plus, you know, the, I think probably was your talk. Before that video. Um, maybe I need to restart my computer because I'm not seeing anything. Yeah, that, that sounds fine. Yeah. Well, Sahand is rejoining us. I'll just say a few words about that September 15th and September 17th series of talks. Uh, there'll be a different focus than our normal seminar series, which has been usually featuring early career scientists. And uh, the goal for this will be to get a general discussion related to physical processes um, related to plumes. And so I'll provide more information as we get closer to that event. But uh, And it'll also be a different time. It'll be two hours earlier in the day. Uh, in part, uh, this helps out with folks uh, in Europe being able to join us. My apologies though to the folks in uh, New Zealand and Hawaii that joined us, that makes it really early for you. Those of you that are just joining us, we have a little technical glitch. Sahand is restarting and, and hopefully joining us here in a minute or two.
also while we're waiting, if uh, if you have a chance to look at the chat, uh, Ben has posted uh, his email address. And certainly if you're interested in giving a talk and you haven't contacted one of us, definitely give uh, Ben an email here. Hello. Hey, Sahan. Hi. Uh, I guess I, I, mean, I may have to, uh, let's see. Okay, I think now try it. Well, sorry for making you wait. No, no, no. We have, we build an extra time. We're good. There we go. That's great. Everything fine. Okay, great. Thanks, Ben and Joe, for uh, such a wonderful seminar. And uh, sorry for making you wait. Um, just trying to see. Where does bubble nucleation during Pliny and silicic eruptions start? <clears throat> nucleation is the first step in uh, volatile sex solution. Uh, it, the depth at which nucleation starts controls uh, the development of porosity, my bubbles overpressure relative to the surrounding melt, and ultimately magma fragmentation. To address this question, we need to look at the vesicles in pyroclasts, which record uh, kinetics of nucleation during magma ascent. Here is an example of such vesicles from 1912 Novorapta eruption. Black areas are uh, vesicles, light areas are glass. What we see in this uh, example is that first, pyroclasts are highly vesicular. Bubble number density is about uh, one million bubbles in one millimeter cube of melt. There are bubbles with different ranges in size. And one important observation is that number of bubbles in these eruptions often exceedingly higher than the number of detectable crystals, suggesting nucleation is homogeneous. Homogeneous nucleation experiments, on the other hand, suggest that uh, homogeneous nucleation starts late, perhaps shallow near, to the, near to, to the fragmentation level. There are, however, some discrepancies between observations and homogeneous nucleation experiments that have cast doubt on this interpretation. Here I am showing bubble number density for seven Pelinian silicic eruptions as a function of the maximum potential supersaturation pressure which is the difference between the uh, uh, inferred saturation water pressure and the final pressure, which is atmospheric pressure. What we see here is that bubble number density in all of these eruptions is high, about 10 to the 15 bubbles per one cubic meter of melt. And for all of these eruptions, it's close to each other, despite the around 200 megapascals of variation in their potential supersaturation pressure. Nucleation experiments are different. These experiments suggest that bubble nucleation starts at around 110 to 120 megapascals of supersaturation. Bubble number density increases as supersaturation increases, and it only reaches the range of observed bubble number densities after about 150 megapascals of supersaturation pressure. This 150 is, however, higher than the maximum potential supersaturation pressure most of these eruptions could reach. The second parameter that controls uh, bubble number density in these eruptions is decompression rate. Here I'm mapping the observed bubble number densities into the decompression rate of homogeneous nucleation using tomorrow's decompression rate. What it suggests is that this bubble number density requires around 100 megapascal per second of decompression rate. This is substantially higher than the compression rate estimates from independent techniques for these eruptions, which are at maximum one megapascal per second. The second discrepancy is in bubble size distributions. Here I'm showing bubble 
accumulated distributions of bubble size distribution for four eruptions. This is log bubble number density. This is log uh, bubble size in diameter. What we see here is that vesicles or bubbles span a wide range in size uh, from one micrometer to one millimeter. And the distribution is power law. In experiments, on the other hand, bubbles usually have a uniform size. As is shown here from an experiment uh, from uh, Gaia et al. 2019. So the purpose of this talk is to uh, resolve some of these discrepancies and infer nucleation kinetics from observations um, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to develop a, a bubble nucleation and growth model that can reliably predict uh, nucleation rate in experiments. Using that model, I am going to verify the heterogeneous nucleation hypothesis by Tom Shea and show that heterogeneous nucleation can reconcile discrepancies between the bubble number density and uh, pre-eruptive water concentration and decompression rate in these linear and silicic eruptions. One important implication of heterogeneous nucleation is that nucleation stops speed. Lastly, I'm going to show that uh, in order to produce power law size distributions, nucleation must start in the magma channel. Nucleation is driven by supersaturation of volatiles, predominantly water for these eruptions. It starts with small fluctuations in concentration of water molecules. As they get close to each other and attach to each other, they form small nanoscale uh, molecular clusters. Formation of such clusters change the free energy of the system, which is known as nucleation energy. There is one uh, negative favorable term known as uh, associated with the uh, removal of these molecules from a supersaturated melt. And there is a positive term associated with formation of a new interface. For a given supersaturation pressure, when we plot nucleation energy as a function of bubble radius or clusters radius, we see it peaks at a size known as critical radius. These randomly formed clusters, if they are larger than this critical radius, they are stable and they grow into the bubbles. If they are smaller than this critical radius, they are unstable, dissolve back in melt. Classical nucleation theory estimates the rate of formation of stable clusters and suggests that at a given supersaturation pressure, it depends on surface tension. In the presence of crystals, clusters tend to form on the surface of crystals. This is what is known as heterogeneous nucleation. And what it does is basically similar to social distancing. It flattens the curve of nucleation energy, makes it favorable for bubbles easier energetically to nucleate, basically facilitate nucleation. First, I'm going to focus on homogeneous nucleation. This is a figure from Mangan and Season showing how strongly nucleation rate depends on surface tension. This is nucleation rate in log, plotted as a function of supersaturation pressure for different values, uh, values of surface tension. We can see that at a given supersaturation pressure, only a small change in surface tension, about 20%, can change nucleation rate by 15 orders of magnitude. That suggests that any reliable prediction of nucleation rate requires an accurate estimation of surface tension. And that's what I'm going <coughs> to do. Excuse me. To find the formulation for surface tension of bubbles, first we did experiments in royal life. Experiments were done by Jim Gardner. I was involved in several of them. 
they start with hydrating uh, cylinders of uh, rhyolite poured from natural obsidian. We hydrate samples at high temperature and pressure um, until uh, for several days to make sure the system is homogeneous. Then the samples are decompressed to final pressure. They're held at the final pressure <clears throat> for some annealing time, and then they are quenched. These cubes, <clears throat> cartoons, show schematically what happens within the interior of a sample. First, we start with a bubble-free, water-rich sample. As samples are decompressed, supersaturation pressure, which is the difference between saturation pressure and melt pressure, drives nucleation. At enough supersaturation, bubbles start nucleating in the system. You zoom into one given bubble. After bubbles form, <coughs> concentration of water, excuse me, Concentration of water near bubbles drops. This produces a diffusion hollow shown with this uh, light regions, meaning these are waterproof regions. This concentration gradients derive diffusion of water molecules into bubbles. As a result, bubbles start growing. As more bubbles nucleate in the system, and these diffusion hollows also grow. At some point, these uh, white regions cover the whole regions of the sample, meaning water concentration starts decreasing throughout the sample. At this point, saturation pressure starts decreasing, nucleation rate peaks and drops quickly. Nucleation rate stops, and samples eventually reach um, equilibrium. Now to simulate these processes within samples, first we get pressure conditions from experiments as a known condition. We estimate nucleation rate using classical nucleation theory as a function of supersaturation pressure. Bubble number density is estimated by integrating nucleation rate through time. We use diffusion model for to estimate uh, diffusion flux. We uh, take mean field approximation. We use Rayleigh Plessed equation to estimate bubble growth rate. Now, because it's not feasible to track the growth rate of each individual bubbles in the system, we use the method of moments first was introduced by Tromaro. Uh, for bubble nucleation in magnetic system. And what it does is basically, it assumes, uh, it tracks bubble growth for one bubble with the size of average of all bubbles. So that's what we do. And then at the end, using conservation of mass, we estimate the decrease in water concentration as a function of diffusion flux and bubble number density. But for all of this to work, we need a proper formulation for surface tension. What is very fascinating about, about volcano science for me is the fact that to understand and make predictions about volcanic eruptions with potential global hazards, we need to understand physics at different scales, including the physics of interfaces at sub nanoscale. scale. This is a cartoon showing uh, the theory of interfaces by Gibbs that's suggesting the interface between two different phases, here melt and bubbles, is not sharp, but rather diffuse, meaning uh, water molar density just gradually increases as we go from left and from melt to the bubble. Coleman, in his seminal 1949 paper, started with this uh, theory of uh, surface tension by Gibbs and developed a formulation for surface tension of monoscale bubbles. This is basically a correction 
uh, of surface tension based for for microscopic measurements, which says um, surface tension of non-escape bubbles <clears throat> depends on their size and a parameter called Tolman lens and depends on the properties of this interface. This Tolman lens, <coughs> sorry. This Tolman lens is in nano scale, sub nano scale actually. So it's not feasible to measure it directly. Rather, we estimated it by matching the observed bubble number density in our experiments with our numerical simulation. Here I'm showing uh, the comparison of bubble number density predicted by our model versus observed in experiments on x-axis. Our experiments produce bubble number densities that vary for eight orders of magnitude from 10 to the eight to 10 to the 16 bubbles per cubic meter of mole. Our model reliably predicts these bubble number densities over the entire range of bubble number density with less than one orders of magnitude error on average for all 45 experiments, suggesting our model can reliably predict nucleation weight. This is a great improvement uh, over previous uh, formulation for surface tension uh, that uh, shown here, the comparison of bubble number density in model and experiments are shown here based on these experiments. So in the next step, now that we can simulate nucleation in experiments, we coupled our nucleation model with a flow in the, it, with a conduit flow uh, within a cylindrical conduit to infer nucleation kinetics from observed uh, vesicle textures. First, I'm going to focus on bubble number density very, from very beginning that we started simulating this nucleation in these eruptions, we came to the conclusion that water saturation pressure for these eruptions is just too low to allow for homogeneous nucleation. A resol resolution to this problem was proposed by Tom Shea that suggests that nucleation in these eruptions is, are perhaps facilitated by the presence of uh, crystals that are perhaps too small to be detected within SEM images. Here it's showing that uh, bubble number, how much nucleation is facilitated by these crystals depends on the contact angle of this, between these crystals and bubbles. The higher the contact angle, the higher nucleation is facilitated. Here it's showing that the contact angle depends on the mineral phase. Magnetite in particular are the most efficient uh, mineral phases in facilitating nucleation, bubble nucleation. Our model verifies that in order to reconcile the observed bubble number densities in, this, in all seven eruptions with the pre-eruptive water concentrations Magnetite is the only mineral phase that can do that. From now on, we assume nucleation is heterogeneous on magnetite. By doing so, we simulated nucleation within each individual eruption. We estimated the decompression rate that allows our model to match observed bubble number densities. Estimated decompression rate on average are shown here with red symbols. We see that based on heterogeneous nucleation, these decomposition rates are substantially lower than previous estimates based on homogeneous nucleation. Second, they are consistent with estimates from some independent techniques, for example, melt embayments or conduit models. So it's, our model suggests that heterogeneous nucleation also reconciles the observed bubble number densities with the Pelinian silicic eruptions decompression rate. One important implications of heterogeneous nucleation is that 
nucleation starts deep. Here is a representative example of our simulation results. Magma water is saturated at 160 megapascal. The dashed line here shows solubility curve of water. As magma starts rising, uh, waters become super saturated. In heterogeneous nucleation, nucleation starts at very low super saturation pressures, shown here at the, the start. <clears throat> nucleation rate peaks very sharply and then drops quickly. Throughout the ascent, uh, water remains close to equilibrium. However, at some point, it starts to it again starts deviating from equilibrium, creating another supersaturation pressure, resulting in a second nucleation right at fragmentation. Nucleation in heterogeneous just starts deep, but nucleations are over two very short lived bursts where bubbles basically all nucleate together and grow together at each individual uh, event. This results in bimodal bubble size distributions, as shown here. That brings us back to our final part of the talk, that's uh, that how we can reconcile uh, bubble size distributions with, with eruption, eruptive conditions uh, in these eruptions. There were several papers uh, by the lower early 2000s, and also some papers before that by Mangan, by Mangan and Cashman that suggested that the power low size distribution is indicative of a nucleation regime that is not nucleation bursts, but rather it's, nucle it's continuous nucleation that continues over the entire ascent of magma in the conduit. That raises two important questions. First, can bubble nucleation be continuous in the first place? Experiments often produce uh, monocyte bubbles, which is itself indicative of nucleation bursts. And then second, if nucleation can be continuous, under what conditions? So to test whether nucleation can be continuous, we did some more experiments similar to the previous experiments with one main difference. Experiments were divided into several groups. In each group, samples were hydrated at same saturation pressure. They were decompressed with a similar decompression magnitude and rate. They were held at the final pressure, but they were quenched at different times to see whether uh, bubble number density changes through time. The idea here was that as samples are decompressing, nucleation rate starts to increase. If we could just stop decompression before nucleation peaks and then the system reaches equilibrium, then nucleation must continue throughout the samples and nearing time bubble number density will increase proportional to nucleation rate. And by quenching them at different times, we should be able to see variation in bubble number density. So what was challenging about these experiments was to come up with conditions that can produce enough nucleation rate that we could observe uh, the growth in bubble number density, but it's not too high that nucleation um, peaks. And also performing these experiments were also very challenging because it was hard to make sure uh, samples within a group have similar decompression and decompression rate. And that was a wonderful job by Jim Gardner with these experiments. Here I'm showing bubble number density observed in our experiments as a function of supersaturation pressure. Different symbols show um, different groups of experiments. There are overall six groups of experiments. What we see here is that samples within each group of experiments have different bubble number densities. For some experiments, it's, the variation is more than two orders of magnitude. 
when we plot observe bubble number densities scale uh, non-dimensional with samples annealing time or hold time that is a scale by a nucleation time scale. We see uh, bubble number density is proportional to samples annealing time. So this nucleation time scale is basically the time scales that determines how long does it take for diffusion to become effective and reduce saturation pressure. Here uh, I'm showing nucleation rate scale uh, during samples annealing time. Nucleation rate can be divided into three stages depending on the ratio of uh, time over nucleation time scale. At first, up to one tenth of nucleation time scale, nucleation rate, nucleation rate is at its maximum. After that, it starts decreasing with time and then it reaches zero where samples are uh, at equilibrium of the system. Our experiments mostly fall in the first stage, several of them on the second and then a few, only one of them were at equilibrium stage. The time scales of these experiments are about 100 seconds, indicating nucleation continued for 100 seconds. The nucleation time scales that we inferred from these experiments are in the order of 1,000 seconds, suggesting nucleation could continue for 1,000 seconds. Now that I, our experiments verify that nucleation can be continuous, let's look at under what conditions in eruptions can be continuous. The difference between eruptions and these experiments is that in experiments, we stopped the compression and continuous nucleation was basically at constant, at constant pressure. But with these Kalinian eruptions with quasi steady mass discharge rate for several hours, it's hard to imagine that uh, decompression at some point stops for bubbles to nucleate. So we, nucleate, we simulated bubble nucleation and growth, this time starting from magma withdrawal during magma chamber and then throughout magma ascent in the conduit. Water becomes saturated at 100 megapascal, equivalent to a depth of about four and a half kilometer. That's, we assume it's one kilometer below the reservoir roof. As this, this Different colors show different past lines of magma in the steady conditions. So what basically controls nucleation rates in eruptions is the competition between decompression rate that tends to increase supersaturation pressure and increase nucleation rate and diffusion rate, which tends to reduce supersaturation pressure and stops nucleation. This competition is shown here in this figure. The solid line is the compression rate. The dashed line is the rate of decrease in saturation pressure of water uh, due to diffusion. First, that is, there is no bubbles. As magma starts rising, uh, water becomes supersaturated. Nucleation is assumed to be heterogeneous again. Bubbles start nucleating in the magma reservoir. As bubbles start nucleating, diffusion rate increases very sharply. At some point, it catches up with the decompression rate and it overpasses it. That's where, if you, that's where supersaturation pressure decreases, nucleation rate peaks and drops. However, as magma is getting close to the entrance, the conduit entrance, it accelerates, causing the compression rate again passes diffusion rate. This results in the buildup of supersaturation pressure. As magma enters the conduit with a slightly converging uh, cross section, it continues to accelerate at some point, basically, supersaturation is high enough that the second nucleation event starts. Due to the 
presence of pre-existing bubbles, this time diffusion rate and decompression rate are close to each other, resulting in a complex feedback between them that results in a continuous nucleation that continues throughout magma ascent in the conduit until fragmentation. This nucleation regime results in a bubble size distribution similar to observations. These three lines shows bubbles to inf the result and bubble size distribution for three different pass lines. Bubble size distribution is slightly different depends on how far the pass line is from the center of magma reservoir for those that are closer to the center nucleate more bubbles in the reservoir, causing this uh, sharp increase in bubble size distribution. But overall, our model suggests that when nucleation starts from magma chamber, it results in a continuous nucleation throughout magma and in the conduit. And that results in a bubble size distribution similar to observations. Thank you. Thank you, Saad. We have plenty of time for discussion and questions. Again, you can use the raise the hand function or you can type something in chat. Um, while people are doing that, Sahand, I had a question for you uh, related to um, the uh, magnetite and the heterogeneous nucleation. Uh, for your calculations, do you assume um, a magnetite um, crystal size distribution or do you just assume there's a sufficient number of nucleation sites? Um, that's an excellent question. So what matters in terms of bubble nucleation is that there are enough magnetites for each bubble. Basically, the number density of magnetites is similar to or higher than bubble number density. Um, there are some interesting observations recently uh, by Mojin et al. that observed magnetite nanolites down to one nanometer and also larger, with number densities way more than bubble number density, 10 to the 22 uh, or so per cubic meter of metal. This is not tested for any of the eruptions that I studied here, but that suggests that magnetite might present uh, at nano scales much higher than uh, number density of bubbles. And that remains to be tested. Yeah, well, that's, that's interesting. I, I, um... Looks like we have a number of uh, questions here in the chat, or at least some comments here. Uh, it looks like there's some, so let's say, uh, Ari Hughes writes, um, has anyone used Raman spectroscopy to see if there are magnetite nanolites in these rhyolite eruptions? I think you just sort of addressed this. Um, uh, yes, actually, Mujin used uh, TEM, but there are some papers by if I pronounce his name for the D Genoa at all, that tested Roman spectroscopy. And they also observed magnetite. But they, I guess with Roman spectroscopy, they couldn't measure the number density. They could just confirm there are magnetite nanolites. Uh, other questions? Well, I, I have another one. Well, Uli has a question. Go ahead, Uli. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Zahan, for this stimulating presentation. I have, in fact, three questions. Um, is your model isothermal? Second, are you assuming that the bubbles are expanding during magma rise and contributing to a change in the decompression rate? And question number three, what is your fragmentation criteria that I saw at, I think, 750 meters below surface? Uh, so for the first, sorry, could you repeat the first question? Sure. Is your model, in your model, are you assuming isothermal conditions? Yes, that's what we assume. At this point, we assume nucleation is driven by decompression rather than the, the change in temperature. Right. Um, and then when your magma is rising, are your bubbles allowed to expand? And is the volume change and the associated acceleration of the magma, is that 
contributing to your change in decompression rate? Yes. So there are different parameters that contribute in the change in decompression rate. One is development of porosity, which basically reduces uh, density in magma. And the other one is uh, viscosity, that as water exhales from melt, viscosity increases, which results in increasing the compression rate, mostly near magma fragmentation. And for the third question, I used uh, Papale uh, criterion uh, for, for magma fragmentation. That's where uh, basically viscosity and the uh, ascent rate of uh, magma plays a critical role in determining magma fragmentation. Right. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Okay, we have a uh, looks like another couple of model questions. Uh, so Jake Jordan uh, writes, does the theory account for the merging of bubbles, so coalescence? Uh, in this last plot, for example, uh, would you expect the lines indicating model results to shift if bubbles interact? So, so but is there coalescence? That's a, that's a very good question. Uh, currently, our model does not account for bubble coalescence. Uh, that remains to be tested how much coalescence within the time scales of magma ascent in linear eruptions can affect bubble size distribution, uh, even that these are high viscosity, high viscosity magma, uh, maybe for, for future investigation. All right, other questions? Um, well, I was gonna ask Sahan, so, of course, you have water, but um, how do you expect things to vary when you add carbon dioxide? That's a good question. Uh, when you add carbon dioxide, you, I would probably expect that uh, nucleation rate at high depths, perhaps in magma reservoir, change. Perhaps we don't need water to be saturated in the reservoir, maybe it's carbon dioxide that starts nucleation in the reservoir. And then uh, the, uh, water adds to it during, during the conduit. Yeah, thanks. It was, I know you didn't have it included here, and there are so many other things you have included. Um, we keep asking you questions about what about this, what about that, but uh, it's a really impressive piece of work. These um, are uh, good questions and actually uh, giving me uh, good ideas for future action. So please. Uh, okay, uh, Ben. Uh, ben Andrews has a question. Hi, Sahan. Thank you for a very nice presentation. My my question is, when you have in your your final model results showing the ascent of plinian magma, or the plinian eruption, and the continuous decompression, sorry, continuous nucleation that's happening. Is the nucleation that's happening during that, is it all heterogeneous or is it homogeneous or something in between during that continuous nucleation? That's a great question. So uh, in these models, we assume magnetized nonlux with enough number density are present. So we just basically start with heterogeneous nucleation and continue with heterogeneous nucleation. But also, we know that maybe water solution during eruptions also affects uh, this form form formation of non alerts during ascent. So coupling crystal nucleation with bubble nucleation would be a very interesting uh, uh, future investigation activity. At this point, we assume monolites are present. Thanks. Other questions out there? Well, I think what we'll do, Sahan, is we'll, we'll thank you one more time uh, for a great talk. Um, what I'll typically do is just leave this uh, Zoom channel open so folks that need to can leave. but. Uh, 
there's usually a few questions that pop up as people are leaving uh, it, kind of the analog to the uh, people coming down to the podium to ask a slightly more private question. So if you can hang out for a little bit longer, but everyone else, thanks again for joining us today. And of course, we'll be back again next week. Talk to you all soon. You know, Sahan, one of the things I've been wondering about uh, lately is um, for, for bubble growth models, what is the best way to validate these approaches? Um, and I'd be interested to get your perspective on that. Sorry, what is, I didn't get this. Uh, so for bubble growth models, what's the best way to validate them? You know, so you did one example of a validation, right? When you compared your, your final distribution. Uh, I wonder if you have any other suggestions for you know, sort of validating numerical approaches to say experiments. Experiments. One. So our, for example, our experiments that shows continuous nucleation, for example, in those experiments, bubbles form at different times. So they, they also have different uh, bubble size distribution. So I guess it would be easier to uh, validate numerical models with those experiments. But that requires that tracking all bubbles individually, which is the, which makes this complicated. Uh, and also, yeah, I mean, in those experiments, we can definitely tell that nucleation are, are happening at the final pressure. So in terms of nucleation, uh, we have a good estimate of what this nucleation rate mm -hmm. is. For bubble growth and tracking each individual, that's, that's another model. I mean, that's complicated, actually, to, to actually need to track uh, water concentration at, at, at each individual point throughout melt to see how much each individual bubble is growing. Yeah, I was kind of wondering if maybe this sequential quenching or something and just, you know, treating a large sample number or something, but yeah, it, it's a hard problem. Yeah. Especially if you add CO2, which is right. eventually useful. Uh, I had a question too, so I'm certain you said this, but uh, I didn't quite catch it. What what exactly did you change between the model you first showed where there are two very discrete nucleation pulses and then the set of simulations that produced more continuous nucleation? Um, so the main change between those two models is that the first one that produced two distinct uh, nucle bubble sizes? Uh, nuclear nucleation started in the in, in, in the conduit, whereas in the second nucleation, in the second model, nucleation starts started with magma within magma reservoir. That was the main change. Also, in the first one, uh, conduit had a constant cross section. In the second one, cross section converged slightly to not mass in the conduit. But uh, the most important factor was the presence of bubbles that were already nucleated uh, in my chamber. So would, would considering other volatiles like CO2 mean that that scenario is more likely to pretty much always happen? Like there will be some CO2 resolved even. Yes, I mean, there are, there are uh, strong evidences of uh, presence of uh, volatile, exalt volatiles within magma chamber, even before it actually starts. So in general, I think it, it is feasible that nucleation starts in, in magma reservoir. Perhaps, yeah, you're right. Uh, volatiles like SO2 or CO2 would, would contribute more to nucleation in this area.
Uh, Julia Hammer is noting that uh, her group's been working on valuing the presence of nanometer magnetite crystals. So that should be an interesting thing to keep an eye out for. Oh, yeah, that, that, that could be very interesting results. I, I'm looking forward to see those results. Uh, one thing I should say, Sahand, is that so a lot of people have left some great comments here, and uh, these are all recorded on the recording. So when I send a talk to you, you should be able to see what people have said throughout. So that's sometimes you know useful for some of these references and things. All right. Well, uh, if anybody else any last questions or comments? We can chat now. Otherwise. Uh, Thanks again, Sahan. That was really great and really appreciate you giving a talk.